The Secret of the Abhor Valley by Talbot Mundy. Episode 2. We should ascend out of perversity, even as we ascend a mountain that we do not know, with the aid of guides who do know. None who sets forth on an unknown voyage stipulates that the pilot must agree with him as to the course, since manifestly that would be absurd. The pilot is presumed to know. The piloted does not know. None who climbs a mountain bargains that the guide shall keep to this or that direction. It is the business of the guide to lead. And yet, men hire guides for the spiritual journey, of which they know less than they know of land and sea, and stipulate that the guide shall lead them thus and so, according to their own imaginings. And instead of obeying him, they desert and denounce him, should he lead them otherwise. I find this of the essence of perversity. From the Book of the Sayings of Tsiang Samdap. Chapter 4 I am one who strives to tread the middle way. The two Tibetans entered, the older man leading, and squatted on a mat which the younger man spread on the floor. Their manner suggested that they had accepted an invitation instead of having gained admission by persistence. But Omni, watching every movement in the mirror, noticed that the older man laid his hand on the seat of the chair he himself had just occupied, which, being old, he might have done to help himself down on the mat, but being active, he almost certainly did for another reason. Chutter Chan sat at his desk magisterially, wiping at the gold-rimmed spectacles again, waiting for the visitors to speak first, but they were not to be tempted into that indiscretion. They sat still and were bland, while Diana came and deliberately sniffed them over. The hound seemed interested. She lay down where she could watch them both, her jowl on her paws, one ear up, and her tail moving slightly from side to side, clearing a fan-shaped pattern in the dust. The old man was a miracle of wrinkles. He resembled one of those Chinese statuettes in ivory, yellowed by time, that suggest that life is much too comical a business to be taken seriously, much too serious a business to be cumbered with pride and possessions. He was a living paradox in a long, snuff-coloured robe, the ends of which he arranged over his lap, leaving the hairy, strong legs of a mountaineer uncovered. He helped himself to an enormous quantity of snuff from an old Chinese silver box that he presently stowed away in a fold of his garment. The pungent stuff appeared to have no effect on him, although Diana, catching a whiff of it, sneezed violently, and Chutterchand followed suit. The young man was another ivory enigma, absolutely smooth in contrast to the elder's wrinkles, and much paler. He too wore snuff-coloured clothes. His head was wrapped in a turban of gorgeously embroidered brown silk, in contrast to the other's monkish simplicity and the cloth of which his cloak was made seemed to be of lighter and better material than the older man's. He was remarkably good-looking, straight-featured and calm, placid, not apparently from self-contentment, but from assurance that life holds a definite purpose, and that he was being led along the narrow road. There was an air of good temper and wisdom about him, no apparent pride nor any mean humility. His eyes were blue-grey, his hands small, strong and artistic. His feet, too, were small, but evidently used to walking. He was in every dimension smaller than the older man, unless mind is a dimension. They appeared to be equals in mental aroma, and they exuded that in the mysterious way of a painting by Goya y Lucientes. Well, what do you want? Chotashand asked at last in English. It was a ridiculous language on the face of it to use to a Tibetan, but the older man had been using English in the outer shop, and Chutterchand knew no Prakrit dialect. The answer, in English devoid of any noticeable accent, was given by the older man in a voice as full of humour as his wrinkled face. The piece of jade, he said, unblinking, ending on a rising note that suggested there was nothing to explain, nothing to argue about nothing to do but be reasonable. He snapped his fingers, and Diana, normally a most suspicious dog, came close to him. He ran his fingers through her hair, and she laid her huge jowl on his knee. Chutterchand crossed and uncrossed his legs restlessly. I haven't it, said the jeweller. Besides, er, uh, ah, uh, you would have to tell me your, that is, er, uh, 
you would have to establish first by what right you make such a demand. You understand me? I have made no demand, the old man answered, smiling. His voice was sweetly reasonable. His bright old eyes twinkled. You have asked what I want. I have told you. Tell me who you are, said Chutterchand. My son, I am a llama. I am one who strives to tread the middle way. Where from? From desire into peace. I mean, what place do you come from? From the same place that the peace of jade came from, my son. From the place to which he who desires merit will return it. Is the jade yours? asked Chutterchand. Is the air mine? Are the stars mine? the lama answered, smiling as if the idea of possessing anything were a joke made by an inquiring child. Well, what right have you to the piece of jade? Chutterchand snapped back at him. He let the irritation through without intending it and smiled directly afterward in an attempt to undo the impression. But if the lama had noticed the acerbity, he made no sign. None, any more than you have, came the answer in the same mild voice. None has any right to it. I have a duty to return it to whence it came, and a duty to you to preserve you from impertinence, if that may be. It is not good, Chutterchand, to meddle with knowledge before the time appointed for its understanding. He who would tread the middle way is patient, keeping both feet on the ground, and his head no higher than humility will let it reach. Be wise, O oh, man of intellectual desires. Destruction is in rashness. His fingers touched Diana's collar and twisted it around until the small brass plate on which Omini's name was engraved came uppermost, but his eyes continued to look straight at Chutterchand. It was the younger man, squatting in silence beside him, his head and body motionless, whose bright eyes took in every detail of the room, not omitting to notice the movement of the lama's hand. Except for the eyes, his face continued perfectly expressionless. Well, uh, ah, before I answer definitely, I would like you to tell me about the jade, said Chutterchand. You will find me reasonable. I am not a sacrilegious person. Uh, ah, can you not establish to my satisfaction that, ah, I would be doing rightly to, uh, let us say, to entrust the piece of jade to you? I think you know that already, said the lama, in a voice of mild reproof, as if he were speaking to a child of whom he was rather fond. What does your heart say, my son? It is the heart that answers wisely if desire has been subdued. I have come a very long way. Desiring the peace of jade, sneered Chutterchand, regretting the sneer instantly, driving fingernails into the palm of his hand with impatience of himself. True said the lama. Desire is not easy to destroy, yet I do not desire it for myself, and for you I desire peace and merit. May the Lord live in your heart and guide you in the middle way. The jeweler moved restlessly. The atmosphere was getting on his nerves. There was an indefinable feeling of being in the presence of superiority, which is irritating to a man of intellect. You mean there will be no peace for me unless I give up the piece of jade to you? He asked tartly. I think that is so, said the lama gently. Well, it is not in my possession. But you know who has it, said the lama, looking straight at him. The jeweler did not answer, and the lama's eyes beamed with intelligence. The young Tibetan moved at last and whispered in his ear. The lama nodded almost imperceptibly, turning the dog's collar around again with leisurely fingers, whose touch seemed magically satisfying to Diana. He looked then once, sharply, at the big brass Buddha, let his eyes rest again on the jewellers, and went on speaking. What a man cannot do is no weight against him. It may be the hand of destiny preventing him from a mistake. The deeds a man does are the fruits that are weighed in the balance and from which the seeds of future lives are saved. Peace be with you. Peace refresh you. Peace give you peace that you may multiply it, Chutterchand. The lama arose, and the younger man rolled up the mat. Diana jumped to her feet. Chutterchand made an attempt to get out of his chair with dignity, 
but the Lama seemed to have monopolized in his own person all the dignity there was in sight, which was embarrassing. Uh, ah, I appreciate the blessing. Uh, ah, are you going? But you haven't told me what I asked about the jade. Ah, would you care to come again? Perhaps. The Lama smiled, stroked Diana's head, bowed, so that his long skirt swung like a bronze bell, and one almost expected a resonant boom to follow, and led the way out, followed by the younger man, who smiled once so suddenly and brightly that Chutterchan's nervous irritation vanished. But it returned the moment they had gone. He jumped at the noise Omni made, pushing the brass Buddha away from the wall. Damn them both, he exploded. Sahib, I hate to be mystified. I detest to be patronized. I feel I made myself contemptible. I could not think. I could not make my brain invent the questions that I should have asked. You did pretty well, said Omni. Seem home, girl. Diana's tail went between her legs, but she did not hesitate. She trotted out of the shop, stood still a moment on the sidewalk, sniffed, vanished. Sahib, they will send someone to loot this shop of mine. Omoni! Tut toot, those two didn't overlook one detail. The young one read my name on Diana's collar and whispered it to the Lama. The Lama knew I was behind the Buddha. He suspected something when he felt the chair seat and found it warm. Worse and worse said Chutterchan despondently. To incur the enmity of such people is more dangerous than to tamper with my snakes. Chutterchan, his brain full of Western and Eastern science, his suit from London and his turban from Lahore, yearned to the West for protection from Eastern mystery. Omni, all English, steeped in the Orient for twenty years, had thrown his thought eastward and was reckoning like lightning in terms of Indian thought. They didn't suspect my presence until after they came in here. Shut up, Chutterchand. Listen to me. They'll have brought a man to watch outside the shop and follow anyone who follows them. They can't have cautioned him about the dog, because they didn't know about the dog, and they would never suspect a dog of having enough intelligence. Their man will be still out there watching the shop door. Wait here. He ran into the outer shop, hid behind one of the curtains at the door, and stood facing the mirror that gave him a view of the constabile's back and of fifty yards of crowded street, including the sidewalk opposite. The constabile appeared to be intently watching somebody, and in less than a minute Omni picked out the individual, a tall, good-looking, boy-faced hillman in a costume that suggested Bhutan or Sikkim, shapeless trousers and a long robe over them with a sort of jacket on top of that. He was trying to look innocent, which is the surest way of attracting attention, and he was so intent on watching the shop door that passers-by continually bunted into him, whereat he seemed to find it hard to keep his temper. Omni watched him for a minute or two, and then spoke to the policeman through the curtain. The policeman nearly gave the game away by turning his head to listen, but spat and scratched himself to cover the mistake. Omni repeated his instructions carefully, and the policeman strolled down street. Omni emerged and walked slowly in the opposite direction. Over the way, the hillman began at once to follow him, suiting his pace to Omni's. Omni crossed the street. So did the policeman. Omni turned and walked toward the hillman. The policeman followed suit, approaching from the rear. Omni came to a halt exactly in front of the hillman, feeling dwarfed by the man's big-boned stature and aware of the handle of a long knife just emerging through a slit in a robe that reeked strongly of ghee. The policeman, nervously fingering his club, halted to the hillman's rear, six feet away. Passers-by began to detect food for curiosity. There were searching glances and a palpable hesitation. There would have been a crowd in sixty seconds. Come with me, said Omni in Prakrit. Why? asked the hillman, staring at him, wide-eyed with surprise at being spoken to in his own tongue. Because if you do, no harm will come to you, and if you don't, you'll go to jail. The hillman's hand crept instinctively toward his knife, and the policeman made ready to swing for the back of his head with a hard wood club. Are you a fool that you don't know a friend when you meet one? asked Omni. 
I have met enemies and women, and one or two whom I called master, and many whom I have mastered, but never a friend yet, the hillman answered. Who art thou? Come with me and learn, said Omni. The hillman hesitated, but the crowd was distinctly beginning to gather now, a little way off, not sure yet, but alert for the first hint of happenings. It grew clear to the hillman that escape might not be easy. I fear no man, he said, turning his head and recognising the policeman, who was hardly two-thirds his size. He spat eloquently for the policeman's benefit, missing him neatly by about the thickness of a knife blade. Whither? he asked then, looking straight into Omini's eyes. Omini led the way across the street into Chutterchan's shop, where he halted to let the hillman go in first. Nay, lead on, said the hillman, stepping aside. No, for you have a weapon, and I have none. Moreover, I have said I am a friend, and I prefer to be a living friend rather than a dead one. Go in first, laughed Omini. The hillman laughed back. There was none of the solemnity about him that enshrouds the men from the northwest frontier. Eastward along the Himalayas, where the smell of sweat leaves off and the smell of rancid butter begins, laughter becomes part of life and not an insult or indignity. He swaggered into the shop with no more argument and at a nod from Omni walked straight through to the office at the rear. Krishna! exclaimed Chutterchand. He jumped for a corner, seized a two-handed samurai sword, drew it from the scabbard and laid it on the desk. I will let my snakes loose, he almost screamed in Hindustani. But the hillman sat down on the floor, on the exact spot where the lama had been, and Omni sat down in the chair facing him, motioning to Chutterchand to resume the other chair and be sensible. But this is the ruffian who came and threatened me, said Chutterchand. That knife of his is sore-edged. Take it from him, Omni. The hillman appeared to know no English but seemed to have made up his mind about Omni. Friendship he might not believe in, but he could recognize good faith. He watched Omni's face as a child follows a motion picture. What is your name? asked Omni. Dawa Tsering. Where are you from? Speedy. Oh my God, exclaimed Chutterchand. Does he say he is from Speedy? They are all devils who come from that country. It is there they practice polyandry, and their dead are eaten by dogs. He is unclean. Who is that lama who was in here just now? Omini went on. Chiang Samdup. Chutterchan did not catch that name, or if he did, the name meant nothing to him. Omini, on the other hand, had to use all his power of will to suppress excitement, and even so, he could not quite control himself. The hillman noticed the change of expression. Aye, he said. Tiang Samdup is a great one. Who is the other who was with him? The young one. His chela. What name? Samding. Some call him San Fun Ho. And what have you to do with them? Instead of answering, the hillman retorted with a question. What is thy name? Say it again. Omni? That sounds like a name with magic in it. Um Mani Padme Hum. Who gave thee that name? Eh? Thy father had it? Who was he? How is it a man should take his father's name? Is the spirit of the father not offended? Thou art a strange one, Omni. Why did you come in here some days ago and threaten Chutterchand? asked Omni. Why not? said the hillman. Did I not ride under a tea rain, like a leech on the belly of a horse, more hours and miles than an eagle knows of? Did I not eat dust and nothing else? Did I not follow that rat Tin Lal to this place? Did I not, pretending to admire the cobra in the window, see him with my own eyes sell the green stone to this little lover of snakes? I said too much. I did too little. I should have slain them both. But I feared, because I am a stranger in the city, and there were many people. Moreover, I had already slain a man, a Hindu, who drove an iron car and broke the wheel of the cart I rode in. I slew him with a spoke from the broken wheel, and it seemed to me that if I should slay another man too soon thereafter, it might fare ill with me, since the gods grow weary of protecting a man too often. So I returned four days later, thinking the gods might have forgotten the previous affair. They owe me many favours. I have treated the gods 
handsomely, and when this little rat of a jeweller swore he no longer had the stone, I threatened him. I would have slain him if I thought he really had it, but it seemed to me he told the truth, and he promised to get the stone back from someone to whom he had entrusted it. And I, vowing I would sever him in halves unless he should keep faith, went and told Siang Sam Dup, who came here accordingly, I following to protect the old man. I suppose Siang Sam Dup now has the stone. Is that so? He shall have it, said Omini. I think thou art not a liar, said the hillman, looking straight into Omini's eyes. Now I am a liar. If I should have said that to thee, it would only be a fool who would believe me, and a fool is nothing to be patient with. But I am not a fool, and I believe thee, or I would plunge this knife into thy liver. Who taught thee to speak my language? Omini saw fit not to answer that. Is it not enough for thee that I can speak it? Where can I find the holy Lama Tsiang Samdup? Oh, as to that, he is not particularly holy, although others seem to think he is. But I am from Spiti, where we study devils and consider nonsense all this talk about purity and self-abnegation and nirvana. Who wants to go to nirvana? What a miserable place, just nothing. Besides, I know better. I have studied these things. It is very simple. Knife a man in the bowels, as the gawkers do with a kukri, or as I do as a rule, and he goes to hell for a while. He has a chance. By and by he comes to life again. Cut his throat, however, and he dwells between earth and heaven. He will come and haunt thee, having nothing else to do, and that is very bad. Hit him here. He laid a finger on his forehead, just above the nose, and he is dead. That should only be done to men who are very bad indeed, and that is the whole secret of religion. Omini looked serious. I would like to talk to you about religion. Oh, I could teach you the whole of it in a very short time. But meanwhile, I would like to know where the holy Lama Tsiang Samdup is staying. I don't know, said the hillman. You are lying, said Omini. Is that not so? Of course. Did you think I would tell you the truth? No, that hardly occurred to me. Well, Diana came in, waving her long tail slowly. She flopped on the floor beside Omini, and there was silence for about a minute, while the hillman stared at her, and she returned the gaze with interest. Finally, her lip curled, showing a prodigious yellow fang, and Omini laid a hand on her head to silence a thunderous growl. That is an incarnation of a devil, said the hillman. In my country, we keep dogs as big as her to eat corpses. Devils, as a rule, are very evil, but I think that one, he nodded at the dog, is worse than others. Well, I go. Say to that fool at the door that he should not offend me with his little stick, for it may be he desires to live. I am glad I met thee, Omini. He waved his hand, smiled like a Chinese cherub, and walked out, ignoring Chatterchand as utterly as if he had never seen him. And at the door he smiled at the policeman as the sun smiles on manure. The policeman did his best, but could not keep himself from grinning back. He who puts his hand into the fire knows what he may expect, nor may the fire be blamed. He who intrudes on a neighbor may receive what he does not expect, nor may the neighbor be blamed. The fire will not be harmed, but the neighbor may be. And every deed of every kind bears corresponding consequences to the doer. You may spend a thousand lives repaying wrong done to a neighbor. Therefore, of the two indiscretions prefer thrusting your own hand into the fire. But there is a middle way which avoids all trespassing. From the Book of the Sayings of Tsiang Samdup Chapter 5 The House at the End of the Passage Chatterchan's usefulness had vanished. His brain did not function now that fear had the upper hand. He could think of nothing but the hillman's knife, and of the possibility that there might be more hillmen who would knock down the policeman at the door, storm the shop, loot everything, and slay. I tell you, Armoni, you have only lived in India twenty years. You do not know these people. He began hurriedly putting in order a mechanical system of wire and weights by which the snakes might be released in an emergency, 
all the while complaining bitterly against a government whose laws forbade the keeping of firearms by responsible, reputable, law-abiding citizens. Omni laughed and walked out with both fists in his pockets, preceded by Diana, who was a lady of one idea at a time, and that one next door to an obsession. She had seen him home. Ergo, she should now show Omni where home was, and he was quite satisfied to follow her. To have tracked Dawatsering the hillman would simply have been waste of time, for the man would soon see he was followed, and would almost certainly play a great game of follow my leader all over town. Moreover, the very name of the Lama, Tsiang Samdup, had excited Omni in the sort of way that news of an ancient tomb excites an archaeologist. It was well on toward evening, that quarter of an hour when the streets are most densely thronged and everyone seems in a hurry to get home or to get something done before starting homeward. All cities are alike in that respect. There is a spate before the slack of supper time and temple services. The hound threaded her way patiently through the crowd and turned down a narrow thoroughfare past fruit and vegetable shops where chafferers were arguing to cheapen produce at the day's end and all the races of the Punjab seemed to be mixed in tired confusion, faded and ill-tempered because the evening breeze had not yet come and walls were giving off the oven heat they had stored up during the day. There was no especial need to take precautions. Sufficient time had elapsed since the Lama and his young companion left the Chani Chok to convince them they had not been followed, and in any case, the most ill-advised thing Omni could have done would have been to act secretively. A man attracts the least attention if he goes straight forward. Those who noticed him at all admired or feared the dog, and she paid no attention even to the mongrels of her own genus, who snarled from a respectable distance or fled down alleyways. Diana turned at last down suffocating passages that led one into another between blind walls where death might overtake a man without causing a stir a dozen yards away. But if you think of death in India, you die. To live, you must think of living and be interested. One of the passages opened at last into a square whose walls were built of blocks that had been quarried from the ancient city, for cities surrender themselves to posterity even as human mothers do. The paving was of the same material, still bearing traces of the ancient carving, but rearranged at random so that the pattern was all gone. At the end of the courtyard was a stone building of three stories, whose upper windows overlooked it. Those below had been bricked up. There was an open door in the wall that led into a long arched passage in which other doors to right and left were visible. Diana ran straight to the open door and stopped. Omni began to feel now like a sailor on a lee shore, with rocks ahead and pirates to windward. It was growing dark, for one thing. At any moment, the hillman with the saw-edged knife and the haphazard notions about death might approach down the passage from the rear. Forward lay unknown territory and a buttery smell that more than hinted at the presence of northerners whose notions of hospitality might be less than none at all. He could be seen through the window shutters but could not see in through them, and he had in his pocket the lump of jade that had lured men all the way from beyond Tilgown into the hot plains that they hate. He wished he had left the jade somewhere. It was the sound of a footstep some distance behind that might be the hillman's which decided him. He strode forward and entered the door, his footsteps echoing under the arch. Diana followed, growling. She seemed to have a feeling they were being watched. The passage presently turned to right and left in darkness, and Omni, as he paused to consider, became acutely conscious that his trespass was not only rash, but impudent. He had no vestige of right to intrude himself into the quarters of strangers, nor had he the excuse that he did not know what he was doing. A tourist might commit such an impertinence and be forgiven on the ground of ignorance, but if he should be knifed for ill manners, he would not be entitled to the slightest sympathy. He decided at once to retrace his steps, and as he turned to face the dim light in the doorway, a voice spoke to him in English suddenly, making his skin creep. Diana barked savagely at a small iron grating in a door to one side of the passage, filling the arch with echoes. 
It took him several seconds to get the dog quiet. Then the voice again. Go away from here. Go away quickly. It sounded like a boy's voice, young, educated. It was not pitched high. There was no note of excitement, hardly any emphasis. Diana barked again furiously, and there was no time for hesitation. Either he was in danger or he was not. The hound said, yes. The boy's voice implied it. Curiosity said, stay. Common sense said, make for the open quickly. Intuition said, jump. And intuition is a despot whom it is not wise to disobey. He reached the courtyard neck and neck with Diana, who nearly knocked him over as she faced about savagely with every hair bristling, fangs bared, eyes aglare. He seized her by collar and tail and threw his weight backward to stop her from springing at the throat of a man in dingy grey who paused in mid-stride, one hand behind him in the doorway. There was another man behind him, dimly outlined in the gloom. Their faces, high cheek-boned and fanatical, almost Chinese, were fiercely confident, and why they paused was not self-evident for the man who held a hand behind his back was armed and with something heavy as the angle of his shoulder proved. Diana saved that second. Her animal instinct was quicker than Omni's eye that read anticipation in the faces in front of him. She nearly knocked Omni over again as she reversed the direction of effort, broke the collar hold and sprang past him, burying her fangs in something. Omni knew that gurgling, smothered growl. She had knocked him sidewise, and he spun to regain his balance while a ten-pound tulwar split the whistling air where his back had been. He was just in time to seize the wrist that swung the weapon, seize it with both hands and wrench it forward in the direction of effort. The saw-edged tulwar clattered on the paving blocks, but the enemy did not fall, for Diana had him by the throat and was wrenching in the opposite direction. It was Dawa Tsering. The hillman's hands groped for the hound's forelegs. To wrench those apart was his only chance, unless Omni could save him. A spring tiger trap was more likely to let go than Diana with a throat hold. Omni took the only chance in sight. He yelled, Guard! to Diana and crashed his fist into the hillman's jaw, knocking him flat on his back as Diana let up for a fraction of a second to see what the new clangor might be. He seized her by the tail then and dragged her off before she could rush in to worry her fallen foe. Her turn again. Struggling to free herself, she dragged Omni in a half circle, nearly pulling him off his feet as the man in the doorway lunged with a long, old-fashioned sword. The third man seemed to prefer discretion, for he still lurked in the shadow. But the man with the sword came on, using both hands now and raising the sword above his head for a swipe that should finish the business. There was nothing for it but to let Diana go. Omni yelled, guard, again, and jumped for the saw-edged tulwar that had clattered away into the shadow. His foot struck it, and he stooped for it as the swordsman swung. The blow missed. Diana seized the foe from behind and ripped away yards of his long cloak. Dawatsering struggled to his feet, more stunned by the blow on the back of his head when he fell than mangled by Diana's jaws. He staggered and seemed to have no sense of direction yet. And now Omni had the tulwa. He was no swordsman, but neither was his antagonist, who was furthermore worried by Diana from the rear. Guard, girl! Omni yelled at her, and discipline overcame instinct. She began to keep her distance, rushing in to scare the man and scooting out of reach when he turned to use his weapon. The third man possibly had no sword, for he still lurked in the doorway. Omni ran, calling Diana, who came bounding after him, turning at every third stride or so to bark thunderous defiance. The strange thing was that no crowd had come. The walls had echoed Diana's barks and Omni's sharp yells to her that must have sounded like the din of battle in the stone-walled silence. It was almost pitch dark now, and there were no lights from the upper windows, although the glow of street lights was already visible like an aura against the sky. The whole affair began to seem like a dream, and Omni felt his hip pocket to make sure the jade was still there. He paused in the throat of the narrow passage by which he had come, sent the hound in ahead of him, and turned to see if he was followed. He heard footsteps and waited. 
In that narrow space, with Diana to guard his back, he felt he could protect himself with the tolwar against all comers. But it was only one man, Dawatsering, holding a cloth to his throat and walking unsteadily. Give me back my weapon, Amoni. The words, spoken in Prakrit, were intelligible enough but gurgled, as if his throat was choked and hardly functioning. Diana tried to rush at him, but Omoni squeezed her to the wall and grabbed her collar. Down, he ordered, and she crouched at his feet, growling. Aye, hold her! I have had enough of that incarnated devil. Give me my knife, Omoni. You call this butcher's axe a knife? You rascal, it's not a minute since you tried to kill me with it. Aye, but that is nothing. I missed. If you were dead, you might complain. Give me the knife and be off. Omini laughed. You propose to have another crack at me, eh? Not I. Those llamas are a lousy gang. They told me I could come to no harm if I obeyed them and said my prayers. Their magic is useless. That she-devil of thine has torn my throat out. I doubt if I shall ever sing again. Give me the knife, and I will go back to the hills. I wish I had never left Spiti. I told you I am a friend said Omini, spearing about in his mind for a clue as to how to carry on. Aye, I wish I had believed you. Give me the knife. Do you know your way around Delhi? No, may devils befoul the city. That is, I know a little. I can find my way to the tea rain. Omini felt in his pocket, found an envelope, and penciled an address on it in bold printed characters. Midway between ten and eleven o'clock tonight, go out into the streets and get into the first gary you meet. Give that to the driver. If the driver can't read it, show it to passers-by until you find someone who can. Then drive straight to that address, and I will pay the gari wala. If your throat needs doctoring, it shall have it. And my knife. I will return it to you tonight at that address. All right. I will come there. I suppose. If I had given you the knife back now, you would have killed me with it. Maybe, but you are no fool, Omini. You had better go quickly before those llamas find some way of making trouble for you. Omini accepted that advice, although he did not believe that if they really were llamas, they would go out of their way to make trouble for anyone outside their own country. It is one thing to attack an intruder, quite another thing to follow a man through the streets and murder him. He was glad he had hurt nobody. Dawatsering's hurt was plainly not serious. There is no satisfaction whatever in violence, if it can possibly be avoided, to a man of Omini's temperament. He walked in a hurry along the narrow, winding passageways and found the street again, bought food for Diana, gave her the package to carry, for she was temperamentally dangerous in a crowd after having used her jaws in action unless given something definite to do and after fifteen minutes' search found a gari, in which he drove to MacGregor's office. MacGregor was not there, so he pursued him to his bungalow, where he fed Diana and examined Curios for fifteen minutes before deciding what to say. MacGregor understood that perfectly. He might not know Omini as he knew files, the law of probabilities and criminal statistics. He might, from deep experience, mistrust his own opinion. But he did know that when Omini poked around in that way, picking up things and replacing them, it was wise to wait and not ask questions. He smoked and watched his servant putting studs into a clean dress shirt. Have you one man you can absolutely bet on, who could take a package to Tilgaon and could be trusted not to monkey with it on the way, or lose it, or let it get stolen? He asked at last. Number 17. Aaron Macaulay, the Eurasian, is leaving for Simla on tonight's train. He would probably want to spend a day or two in Simla, but he could go on to Tilgarn after that. He's quite dependable. Yes, I trust Aaron Macaulay. I want a small box, stout paper, string and sealing wax. MacGregor produced them and watched Omini wrap up the piece of jade and seal it with his own old-fashioned signet ring. He addressed the package to Miss Hannah Sandburn at the Tilgon mission. Better tell Macaulay it contains banknotes, said Omini. That'll give him a sense of importance and keep him from being too curious. Tell him to ask Miss Sandburn to keep the package there for me until I come. All right, now what's the theory? 
Nothing much. I was attacked just now, not serious. The man who got the worst of it will join us after dinner. I'll give you all the grisly details then. Might possibly surprise you. See you again at Mrs. Cornet Campbell's. Who is a fountain of surprises? said McGregor, smiling. Meanwhile, how about protection? Do you want a bodyguard? It was not exactly clear why he was smiling. No, said Omini, looking contemplatively at Diana, who appeared to have fallen asleep on a Bokhara rug. I've got a more than usually good one, thanks. Observe. He started on tiptoe for the door. Diana reached it several strides ahead of him and slipped out first to sniff the wind and make sure that the shadows held no lurking enemy. If men were as faithful as dogs, he began. But MacGregor laughed. They're not. Faith, very largely, is absence of intelligence. Intelligence has to be trained to be honest. It has no morals otherwise. Without a good Scots grounding in religion, the greater the intelligence, the worse the crook. Oh, rot said Omini, and walked out, leaving MacGregor chuckling. A certain poet, who was no fool, bade men take the cash and let the credit go. I find this good advice, albeit difficult to follow. Nevertheless, it is easier than what most men attempt. They seek to take the cash and let the debit go, and that is utterly impossible. For as we sow, we reap. From the Book of the Sayings of Tsiang Samdap Chapter 6. Missish Anbun is mad. Even since the armistice, when military glory topped the rise and started on the downgrade of a cycle, there are still worse fates than being wealthy in your own right and the wife of a colonel commanding a lancer regiment, even if your children have to go to Europe to be schooled and your husband is under canvas half the time. And there are much worse fates than dining with Mrs. Cornet Campbell anywhere, in any circumstances. To be in a position to invite yourself to dinner at her Delhi bungalow means that, whatever your occupation, you may view life now and then from the summit, looking downward. Viceroys come and go. Mrs. Cornock Campbell usually educates their wives. They say she knows everything, even why the German crown prince once cut short a tour of India, and that, of course, means she is no longer in the bloom of youth and never indiscreet for you don't learn state secrets by being young and talkative. Omni is one of her pet cronies, though they rarely meet, which is the way things happen in India. He looks such a blunt, old-fashioned bachelor in a dinner jacket, dating from away before the war. The contrast he creates with modern artificial cynicism is so satisfying, and he so utterly lacks pose or pretense that he brings out all her vivacity which is apt to be chilled when imitation people assume manners for the sake of meals. The talk, for the hour while dinner lasted, was of anything in the world but ringding llamas and the arbor country. Omni was probed for epigrams, coined in the depths of his forest, that should make John McGregor wince and laugh, such statements as that, you can look for faults or virtue, vultures prefer ullage, suit yourself, a man sees his own vices and his own virtues reflected in his neighbour, nothing else. Another's crimes are what you yourself would commit under equally strong pressure. His virtues are greater than your own, if only because they're less obvious. The most indecent exhibition in the world is virtue without her cloak on. Not polite, exactly, particularly not to the chief of the Secret Service, but not tainted by circumlocution. And again, they say the fact that people work entitles them to vote. Horses work harder than men. Soapbox nonsense. The only excuse for work is that you like it, and the only honest objection to loafing is that it's bad for you. John McGregor, in the rare hours when he is not feeling the pulse of India's restless underworld, is an addict of the wee free Kirk with convictions regarding the devil. A personal devil, said Omni. I wish there was one. Hell breeds more dangerous stuff than that. If I thought there was a devil, I'd vote for him. He'd clean up politics. John McGregor, ganglion of India's crime statistics and acquainted with all evil at first hand, was shocked to Mrs. Cornet Campbell's huge delight. Now, John, what have you to say to that? McGregor cracked a nut nervously and sipped at his Madeira. 
He could find a host of half-baked theorists to praise him for the blasphemy, he said deliberately. But the ultimate appalling circumstance of being damned is a high price for applause. Omni laughed. I'd rather be thought damned by a man I respect than be praised by damned fools, he retorted. We three will meet beyond the border, Mac. I'm looking forward to it. I can't see anything unpleasant in death, except the morbid business of dying. May there be no moaning at the bar when I put out to sea. It looks as if I might be the first of the three of us to take that trip. So, by a roundabout route, the conversation drifted to its goal. Over her shoulder, at the piano, in the rose and ivory music room after dinner, Mrs. Cornet Campbell tossed the question that brought secrets to the surface. John says you are going to the Arbor country. John McGregor's eyes glowed with anticipation, but he crossed his legs and lit a cigarette, throwing himself back into the shadow of an antique chair to hide the smile. Going to try, said Omni. My sister and Fred Terry disappeared up there twenty years ago. They left no trace. Are you sure? She went on playing from Chopin, and Omni did not notice the inflection of her voice. He was listening to the piano's overtones, vaguely displeased when she closed the piano without finishing the nocturne. I was at Tilgown seven months ago, she said. Colin, that was her husband, had to go to Burma, so I went to Darjeeling. I heard of the Marmaduke mission and grew curious. I wrote, and Miss Sandburn kindly invited me to come and stay with her. The most delightful place. Please pass me a cigarette. Did Hannah mention me? asked Omni. Indeed she did. You seem to be her beau ideal, and funnily enough she said you, and the Lama Tiang Samdup must have been twin brothers in a former incarnation. She told me you and he have never met each other, although you are co-trustees with her under Marmaduke's will. It sounds like Gilbert and Sullivan. I didn't see the Lama, but I did meet someone else who is quite as interesting. McGregor crossed his legs and blew smoke at the ceiling. How well do you know Miss Sanburn? asked Mrs. Cornet Campbell at the end of a minute's silence. She was watching Diana, stretched out on the bearskin, hunting gloriously in a dream Valhalla. If she saw Omini's face, it was through the corner of one eye. Oh, as well as a man can ever hope to know a very unusual woman, said Omini. That doesn't go deep, does it? I admit I suspected you at first. Then I remembered how long I have known you and, well, you're unorthodox and you're a rebel, but I couldn't imagine you leaving a child nameless. What on earth do you mean? asked Omni. So I suspected Marmaduke, naturally, but all sorts of dates and circumstances turned up quite casually, which eliminated him. I was at Tilgarn a whole month before I was quite sure that Miss Sanburn is not a mother. I was almost disappointed. She is such a dear, I admire her so much, that it would have given me a selfish satisfaction to know such an abysmal secret and to keep it even on a deathbed. However, the child is not hers. She calls her an adopted daughter, though I doubt that there are any legal papers. The girl is white. She's about twenty. The strangest part is this, that the girl disappears at intervals. This is all news to me, said Omni. Mac said something, but it isn't news, you iconoclast. It's a most romantic mystery. The girl was there when I arrived. She wouldn't have been, but you know what a business it is to get to Tilgown. I was supposed to wait for ponies and servants from the mission. They didn't come, and as there was a party of Raja's people going, I travelled with them. They were in a hurry, so I reached the mission quite a number of days before I was expected, and I met the girl on the far side of the rope bridge just before you reached Tilgown. You remember the place? There's a low, steep cliff with only a narrow passage leading out of it. She was sitting there nursing a twisted ankle, nothing serious, but she couldn't get away without my seeing her, and of course it never entered my head to suspect that she would want to avoid me. She told me her name was Elsa. That was my sister's name, remarked Omni, who had an old-fashioned way of growing sentimental when that name cropped up among intimates. I lent her a spare pony and she rode up to the mission with me. Jolly. She was the jolliest girl I have ever seen, all laughter and intelligence, with strange, sudden fits of demureness. Or perhaps that isn't the right word. Freeze isn't the right word, either. 
She would suddenly lapse into silence, and her face would grow absolutely calm. Not expressionless, but calm, like a Chinese girl's. It was as if she were two distinct and separate women. But she's white. I watched her fingernails. Might be Chinese, Omini suggested. They're given to laughter, and their fingernails don't show the dark lunula when they're pressed. Hannah Sanburn receives all comers at the mission. I am certain she is English, Mrs. Cornet Campbell answered. But as far as I could judge, she speaks Tibetan and several dialects perfectly. Her English hasn't a trace of Chi-Chi accent. She has been wonderfully educated. She has art in every fibre of her being, plays the piano fairly well, mostly her own compositions, and you may believe me or not, they're fit to be played by a master. And she draws perfectly from memory. That night at supper and afterward, she talked incessantly and kept on illustrating what she meant by drawing on sheets of paper. Wonderful things, not caricatures, snapshots of people and things she had seen. Wait, I've kept some of them. Let me show you. She found a portfolio and laid it on Omini's lap. He turned over sheet after sheet of pencil drawings that seemed to have caught motion in the act. Yaks, camels, oxen, Tibetan men and women taken in mid-smile, old monastery doorways, flowers, done swiftly and with humour. There was a sureness of touch that men work lifetimes to achieve, and there was a quality that almost nobody in this age has achieved, a sort of spirit of antiquity, as simple as it was indefinable in words. It was as if the artist knew that things are never what they seem, but was translating what she saw of things' origins into modern terms that could be understood. The drawings were of yesterday, clothed in the garments of today and looking forward to tomorrow. She seemed to see right through you, Mrs. Cornet Campbell went on. I don't believe the smartest man in the world could fool that girl. She has the something within that men instinctively recognize and don't try to take liberties with. She seemed equally familiar with Tibetan and European thought as well as life and to know all the country to the northward. I gathered she had been to Lhasa, which seems incredible, but she spoke of it as if she knew the very street stones, and you'll see there are sketches of bits of Lhasa in that portfolio. Notice the portrait of the Dalai Lama and the sketch of the southern gate. And all the while the girl talked Miss Sanborn seemed as proud and as uncomfortable as a martyr at the stake. When Elsa began to talk of Lhasa, I thought Miss Sanborn would burst with anxiety. You could see she was on the perpetual point of cautioning her not to be indiscreet, but she restrained herself with a forced smile that made me simply love her. I know Miss Sanborn was in agonies of terror all the time. When Elsa had gone to bed, that was long after midnight, I asked Miss Sanborn what her surname was. She hesitated for about thirty seconds, looking at me. I know how she looked, said Omini, like a fighting man with a heartache. That look has often puzzled me. What did she say? She said, Mrs. Cornock Campbell, it was not intended you should meet Elsa. She is my adopted daughter. There are reasons. And of course, at that I interrupted. I assured her I don't pry into people's secrets. She asked me whether I would mind not discussing what little I already knew. She said, I'm sorry I can't explain but it is important that Elsa's very existence should be known to as few people as possible, especially in India. Of course, I promised, but she agreed to a reservation that I might mention having met the girl, if anything I could say should seem likely to quiet, inquisitive people. And that was a good thing, because I had no sooner returned to Delhi than John McGregor came to dinner and asked me pointedly whether I had seen any mysterious young woman at Tilgarn. I think John intended to investigate her with his staff of experts in... What is the right word, John? Worm's eye views, said MacGregor. Not all the king's horses nor all the king's men could have called me off, as you did with a smile and a glass of Madeira. Thus are governments corrupted. So you're the second individual to whom I have opened my lips about it, said Mrs. Cornet Campbell, not exactly watching Omini, but missing none of his expression, which was of dawning comprehension. I'm beginning to understand about a hundred things, he said musingly. You'd think, though, Hannah would have told me.
Mrs. Cornet Campbell smiled at John McGregor. Didn't you know he'd say just that? Wake up, Cotswold. This isn't church. It's because you're her closest friend that you're the last person in the world she would tell. She's a woman. Then there were noises in the garden, and Diana left off dreaming on the bearskin to growl like an earthquake. An acquaintance of mine, said Omini. If you can endure the smell, please let him in, or we might try the veranda. Diana had to be forcibly suppressed. The butler, a Goanese, which means that he had oddly assorted fears, as well as a mixed ancestry and crossbred notions of convention that were skin deep and as hard as onyx, had to be rebuked for near rebellion. And Dawat Sering, with his neck swathed in weirdly smelling cloth, had to be given a mat to sit on, lest he spoil the carpet. It needed that setting to make plain how innocent of cleanliness his clothes were, and his reek was of underground donkey stables, with some sort of chemical added. There were reasons, connected with possible eavesdroppers, why the deep veranda was unsuitable. And the knife, Omini, he asked, squatting cross-legged, admiring the room. Is this thy house? Thou art a rich man. I think I will be thy servant for a while. Is the woman thy wife? It is not good to be a woman's servant. Besides, I am a poor hand at obedience. Nay, return me my knife, and I will go. Not yet, said Omini, studying by which roundabout route it might be easiest to elicit information. He decided on the sympathetic personal. The man's neck had plainly received attention, but the subject served. Shall I get a doctor for your neck? Nay, Tsiang Samdup made magic and put leeches on it and some stuff that burned. Lo, I recover. You mean the holy Lama Tsiang Samdup? The Ringding Galong Lama? He who was at Chutter Chan's this afternoon? Omini knew quite well whom he meant, but he wanted to convey the information to the others without putting the hillman on guard. By the look in the hillman's eye, his mood was talkative, boastful, a reaction from the failure of the afternoon. Aye, the same. I should have thought his cello would have attended to that. Samding? Nay, they say that fellow is too sacred altogether. Not that I believe it. I could cut his throat and show them he dies gurgling and whistling like any other man. But the lama looks after him like an old wife with a young husband, and the boy mayn't soil his fingers. Rebuke thy dog, Omini. She eyes me like a devil in the dark. So that is better. Oh, hey, I wish I had never come southward. Yet I have seen this house of thine. It is a wonder. It will serve to speak of when I go back to Spitty and tell tales around the fire. Omini translated for the other's benefit and went on questioning. I suppose you will return to Tilgown with the Lama and his Chela? May the stars and my karma forbid. I go under the belly of a tea rain as I came. To Kalka, I go and thence by foot on the old road to Simla, where I know a man who will pay me to carry goods to the Raja of Spiti. That is a long journey and a difficult. I shall be well paid. Again, Omini translated. Ask him how and where he learned that trick of riding under trains, said MacGregor. Oh, as to that, said Dawatsering, there are few things simpler. In my youth, he spoke as if he were already ancient, instead of perhaps two or three and twenty. I desired a woman of Speedy, whose husband was unwise. He should have gone on a journey oftener, and he should not have returned in such haste. I wearied of his homecomings, so I lay in wait and slew him. And the Raja of Speedy, who is a jealous man, liking to attend to all the slaying in that country, which is nevertheless too much for one individual, even if he does have an army of fifty men, find me three hundred rupees. Where should I get such a fortune? Yet, unless I paid it, I should have to join his army and gather fuel, which is as scarce in Spiti as an honest woman. So I ran away. And after wandering about the hills a month or two, enjoying this and that adventure, I reached Simla where I met a man with whom I gambled, he offering to teach me a new game, not knowing we used dice in Spitty, and his dice were loaded. So I substituted mine, and when I had won from him more than he could pay, he offered to teach me his profession. Gambling? asked Omini. Nay, 
I never gamble. I take no chances. I do the gods a favor now and then, since it seems from all accounts they need it, but I never trust them. That fellow told me of the tea rains that run from Kalka southward, to and fro, and of the many rupees that the passengers leave in their pockets while they sleep. He supposed I would undertake the dangerous part, and thereafter share the loot with him, and he showed me how to hide under a tea rain until nightfall and then. But it was easy, and I found out after a while where he hid the half of our profits, which he claimed as his share after I had done all the climbing in and out of windows in the dark. So I took what he had hidden, and, what with my own savings, the total amounted to more than a thousand rupees. Then I returned to Spiti, and I buried the money in a certain place, and went to the Raja and lied to him, saying I had earned the amount of the fine as a woodcutter, but that a certain one, who was always my enemy, had stolen the money from me on the very first night that I returned. So the Raja transferred my fine to that other man, who had to pay it, and then, of course, I had to leave Speedy again, swiftly. That other man has many friends, but I will find a way to deal with him. When did you first meet the holy lama Tsiang Samdup? Omini asked. Ha! I returned to the tea reins, being minded to make a fortune, but the gods played a scurvy trick on me. I was doing nicely, but on a certain night a fool of a policeman pounced on me at an istashun just as I was crawling in under the wheels. He dragged me out by the leg, and it was not a proper time to kill him, since there were many witnesses. So I raised a lamentation, saying I would ride to Delhi to the bedside of a friend, and that I had no fare. And lo, the Lama Tiang Samdup stepped out of the tea rain and paid my fare, praying that I would permit him thus to acquire merit. So I rode with him to Delhi, he questioning me all the night long, and I, at my wit's end, to invent sufficient lies wherewith to answer him. And in Delhi, I being a stranger in the city, he set out with me to help me find my friend. And there being no friend, we naturally did not find him, whereat the Lama wept. So it seemed to me he was a man who needed someone to look after him. Moreover, he was certainly a very rich man, and I had not yet thought of a way of defeating my enemy in Spiti. Restrain thy she-dog, Omoni. I like not the look in her eye. Omni put Diana outside with orders to guard the front door. How long ago did this happen? he asked, forcing himself to look only vaguely interested as he resumed his seat. Oh, maybe a year ago, or longer. The time passes. I agreed to serve the Lama for a while, although he wearied me with his everlasting lectures about merit and the wheel and the gods know what else. Also, he keeps low company, actors and singers and such folk. When he left me at Tilgown on his way northward, I was well content to rest from him a while. He gave me money, of which he has plenty, although he is much too careful with it. And there were good-looking girls at the mission, which is a marvel of a place with a high wall. But I saw how to climb the wall. So it came about that there was trouble between me and Mrs. Anbun, she who is abbess of the place, a bold woman who was not afraid to stand up to me and speak her mind. Lo, I showed her my knife and she laughed at it. I speak truth. So by the time the Lama came back from the north, I was a byword and a mockery among the people of Tilgown, who are a despicable lot, but prosperous, and full of a notion that Mrs. Anbun is the cause of all good fortune. And she, of course, being a woman and unmarried, which is witchcraft, told tales to the Lama about me when he returned, whereat he, the old fool, was distressed, saying he was answerable, in that he had left me there during his absence. He spoke much about the wheel and merit and responsibility. And I, who cannot help liking the old fool, although I laugh at him, and at myself for eating rebuke from him, was ashamed. I, I was ashamed. He made me promise to perform acts of repentance, as he said, to offset my own sins, but as I think, because he had a use for me. And now he had Samding with him, the Chela, whom all men in that part regard as a reincarnation of some ancient prodigy who has been dead so long that his bones must have dissolved into powder. But the priests tell just such tales, and who can say they are not true? And there was much excitement over a piece of green stone. It had disappeared from somewhere up north, although none mentioned the name of the place whence it had come, but I had heard something 
and the rest I saw. There had come a man from Arba to the mission, dying of a belly wound, and if my advice had been asked, he would have been left to die outside the wall, because those Arbas are devils. I have heard they eat corpses, which is a dog's business, and I know none dares to enter their country. But Missish Anbun is mad, and she took him into the mission, where they stitched up the belly wound and tried to make him live. But he died, and they found the stone in his clothing, and Missish Anbun kept it. There was much talk about the stone, for the most part nonsense. Some said this, and some said that, but it was clear enough that whoever really owned the stone had set inquiries going, and a rumour had been spread that there was danger in possessing it. I had made up my mind to steal the stone from Mrs. Shanbun and discover how much it might be worth to a man of some skill in bargaining, for it seemed to me there could not be much danger to me as long as I had my knife. Where is my knife, Omoni? Presently? Well, don't forget to return it to me. That knife and my future are one. As I was saying, I was about to steal the stone, but a girl in the mission, one whose virtue I had satisfactory reason to suspect, forestalled me. She took the stone and ran with it toward the house of Sirdar Siroha Singh, who is a prince of devils and a father of lice and no good. He had warned me to leave Tilgown, and I had told him who his father was. And there had come a rat of a man named Tin Lal to Tilgown, too much given to asking questions. Him I was minded to slay, because that girl, whose virtue I say was not such as others seemed to think, no longer smiled at me when I sat in the sun near the mission gate, but took more notice of Tin Lal than was seemly. Night after night I had waited for her, and it came to my ears too late that there was a reason that concerned me for the smile in Tin Lal's impudent eye. I wetted the edge of my knife on a stone by the image of the Lord Buddha that is set into a niche in the mission wall. But the girl stole the stone and ran off with it, and Tin Lal waited for her at a narrow place where the path to the Sirdar's house runs between a cliff on the one hand and a deep ravine on the other, a place where the eagles nest and there is mist ascending from the waterfall below. He pushed her into the ravine and climbed down after her, taking the stone. And then he disappeared. And Sirdar Sirohi Singh, who is a dog, whose liver is crawling lice, whose heart is a dead fish, accused me of the deed. There was talk of bringing me before the Raja, and there was other talk of driving me away. Nevertheless, I had promised the Lama I would wait for him in Tilgaon. I was not minded that my time had come. Moreover, I am one who keeps promises, so I slew the loudest talkers very secretly by night, and after that there was not so much insolence toward me when I passed up and down the village. Oh, hey, but I was weary of Tilgown, and when the Lama came, he at first believed I had slain the girl and stolen the stone. But he is not entirely a fool in all respects, and the Chela Samding has more brains than a grown man with a beard down to his belly. It was the Chela who said that if I had in truth stolen the stone, I would certainly have run away with it and not have stayed in Tilgown like an eagle hatching eggs. And the Lama, having listened to a million lies and discovered the truth like a bird in the mist among them, told me I might earn much merit by following the trail of Tin Lal to the southward and recovering the stone. The Lama Tsiang Samdup said to me, Slay not, but obtain the stone from Tin Lal, and I will pay thee more for it than any other dozen men would pay. And he named a price a very great price, which set me to dreaming of the girls in Spiti, and of a valley where I am minded some day to build a house. So I, having furthermore a grudge of my own against Tin Lal, agreed, and I followed the rat Tin Lal to Delhi, where, as I have told you, I saw him, through the shop window where the snake is, sell the stone to Chutter Chand, the jeweller. But the Lama and Samding had come to Delhi likewise, and to them I told what I had seen, having lost sight of Tin Lal in the crowd. And now give me back the knife, Omini, that I may hunt for Tin Lal. I have an extra grudge against him. Has he not robbed me of the price the Lama would have paid me for the stone? Oh, he! My honour and my anger and his end are one. Give me the knife, Omini. 
The hillman smiled winningly, as one who has talked his way into a hard man's heart. He held his hand out, leaning forward as he squatted on the mat. Tin Lal is in the jail, said Omni. Oh, is that so? That makes it easy. I will wait outside the jail. They will not keep him in there forever. What is that house, where you tried to kill me this afternoon? Omni asked. A place kept by Tibetans, where the Lama stays when in Delhi. That is where the actor people come to see him. Why did you attack me? Why not? You had said, the Lama shall have the stone. Therefore it was clear to me that you must have it. Therefore, if I should take it from you, I could sell it to the Lama. I am no fool. Omni, with something like contentment in his eye, began to translate for the benefit of the others as much as he could remember of Dawa Tsering's tale, tossing occasional questions to the hillman to get him to repeat some detail. It was the company the Lama kept that seemed to interest him most. If you like, said MacGregor, when the tale was finished, I'll have those Tibetans searched. Omni was about to refuse that offer, but his words were cut short by an uproar on the porch. Diana, on guard and therefore unable to be tempted from her post, was barking like a battery of six-pounders. He strode into the hall and listened, heard retreating footsteps, someone in no hurry, pat-pad padding firmly on soft-soled shoes toward the garden gate. He opened the door. Diana glanced angrily at a long, narrow, white envelope that lay on the porch floor under the electric light and resumed her furious salvos at the gate. So ho, old lady. Someone you knew brought a letter, eh? You weren't indignant till he threw it down and retreated. You never said a word while he was coming up the path. He wetted his finger and tested the hot night air. Aha, uh -huh. winds toward you. Recognised his smell. That's clear enough. All right, good dog, on guard again. He picked up the envelope and walked into the house. Did you tell the Lama where you were coming tonight? He asked, standing over Dawa Tsering, looking down at him. Aye, I did. Why not? How should I know, Omoni, that this was not a trap, and I with no knife to hack my way out of it? Suppose that you had thrown me in the jail, who should then have helped me unless the Lama knew? I am no fool. Did you tell him I said he shall have the green stone? Nay, how often must I say I am no fool? Would he buy the stone from me after I had told him you said he shall have it? The letter, the letter, exclaimed Mrs. Cornet Campbell. Are you made of iron, Cotswold? How can you hold a mysterious letter in your hand without dying to know what is in it? Give it to me. Let me open it if you won't. Omni passed it to her. John MacGregor lit another cigarette. 